Um, my last year at Oxford I spent working extremely hard. I'd only got a second in mods and, and I was determined to get a first in grades and left nothing to chance and worked for the last nine months extremely hard. Got my first um, and um, then I had to decide what to do next. So the, so the year before had been the first year of the um, awarding of Kennedy Fellowships, which were the, the, the money spent um, to commemorate JFK after he was assassinated had been uh, a considerable sum in Britain and was used to set up a smaller version of the Rhodes Scholarships in reverse to Harvard and MIT in honour of JFK. Uh, the previous year um, uh, they'd been awarded for the first time, Emma Rothschild was in the first cohort, and I went in for that. Um, Isaiah Berlin was on the panel, my old patron, and whether or not he helped, um, I got one. And so in the autumn of that year, 1969, I, um, in the old-fashioned way, we sailed, we didn't fly, um, in the USS United States, huge, powerful um, uh, American liner. Uh, we sailed through a the edge of a hurricane, I remember, a very beautiful voyage um, with uh, blue skies but tremendous seas, and arrived in America in a most fascinating time, of course. Um, my, I only spent a year, I didn't do a proper degree, I began to feel, to compare my own lesser career with, with a more successful one, I began to feel rather like Clinton after a year that my country couldn't possibly do without me and I just <laughs> returned home. There had been the 1970 election and the Conservatives returned, which I missed, I was in America for that, um, but I uh, came back early, so I didn't take a degree. I studied government, as they call it, at Harvard, as opposed to politics at Yale, and um, had the most privileged and fascinating time, but partly because the Kennedy School of Government was in the process of being set up. Uh, uh, the old Litauer Center was being converted into the, the new powerhouse of the study of government. Many of the people had already been assembled, Richard Newstadt, I remember, Graham Allison, um, Bob Nye, many other people who became uh, very well known in that field of work, already well known. Kissinger was down in Washington advising the government. It was the year of the bombing of Cambodia and of student riots and then huge student protest. It was a rather fascinating transition. When, uh, for half of the year, the, uh, there were sort of street battles between almost professional protesters called things like the Weathermen and, and so on, fighting the police and tear gas, rather like going back to my teenage visits to Greece. Um, there was often a smell of tear gas in the streets. But then the bombing of Cambodia happened and the, the, the whole student body and wider than students sort of took the protests away from the self-appointed leaders and it was very moving, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people on Boston Common um, and the university on strike um, closed for a considerable time. The, the, the students had been killed at Kent State University by the National Guard. It was an extraordinary and fascinating time to be an observer in, um, in a foreign country watching tremendous political travails. Um, but I also learnt a lot. I lived en famille with a wonderful, by luck, with a wonderful scholar, nothing to do with my subject, called Ernst Kitzinger, who was the greatest Byzantinist of his day, who had run down Barton Oaks in Washington, had been had catalogued the uh, Byzantine collection at the British Museum when he arrived as a refugee in 1938, was then deported to Australia in one of the, in the early panics of the war. Was, uh, the telegram arrived on the boat, I believe, from Harvard, and we lost him. Um, wonderful man. But and through his house flowed a wonderful selection of that diaspora of um, uh, scholars driven out of Germany, who, who with whom there was a sort of fellow feeling, and from whom Harvard and America in general had uh, benefited hugely, of course. So I met all sorts of grand people who I wouldn't otherwise have met, ranging from Carl Friedrich to um, Lionel Trilling. Uh, you know, people mm. came and went through his house and it was a lovely atmosphere. But I also learned things I hadn't learned at Oxford. 
things that were taken seriously in the in the postgraduate school of government at at um, Harvard, like uh, Machiavelli and Hegel and uh, Marx and so on, that had been treated rather with scepticism in the in the great school at Oxford. So it was a, a very uh, a, a rather wonderful year, shaking free of Eton, of Oxford, and of England for a bit. I then travelled around the world, the long way round, um, in a sort of um, by boat. Uh, no, mostly by air. Mm. I had one of those air tickets. I was given by my uncle one of those air tickets. As long as you kept on going around the world, you could, you could go up and down. Zigzag. So I went to Vietnam in the war. I went to Burma, um, but then a closed country, um, with an introduction from the dictator Nhi Win's doctor, um, and was summoned at once to dinner with the dictator, rather to the wrath of the British Embassy, who confined to their compound. I went to Australia, I went to um, Thailand, I went to... A grand tour. <laughs> a grand tour. Part of my rather self-conscious prince's education. And it was a fascinating time, of course, in Southeast Asia and Southern Asia, because there was the center of conflict in Vietnam, in Indochina, um, with the two world empires fighting. And the British ex-empire, rather skillfully keeping out of it, with the exception of the Australians, we owe Harold Wilson a good deal for keeping us out of that war. I stayed in Vietnam with his token contribution, who was a Kenya policeman called Walter Pridgen, and um, learned from him that the American statistics of how they were winning were to, to be treated with some skepticism. And I went to, to India, to Nepal, to Kenya, to Egypt, still with Soviet, uh, a, a massive Soviet presence then, and back to England at Christmas time, 1970. What were your sympathy? I mean, were you sympathetic to the anti-war? Um, or were you? <coughs> I was not sympathetic. I was not not sympathetic to the to the Soviet position. Mm. Um, I, I think I I felt in a rather superior British way that the Americans, like the French, were making a frightful hash of it. You know, <laughs> we had done much more skillfully in Malaya and so on. Very mm. childish thoughts, really. I don't think I was. I don't think I, I can't claim to be a, a protester against the war, really. I thought it was their war. I was glad we were not in it. I was sceptical of the claims of the North to be a, a sort of heroic and social democratic place. Uh, I, I don't think I accepted the argument of dominoes that if Vietnam fell, the whole of Southern Asia would become communist. And I could see from my visit there that they were never going to win. Mm. So in that sense, in a pragmatic sense, I, was, I thought it was futile. Mm. Um, but I, I can't claim to have been a, a strong protester against the Vietnam War, though I was glad we weren't involved. Mm. Um, there had earlier at the Oxford Union been famous debates. Um, mm. Michael Stewart, the Foreign Secretary, was shouted down mm. and so on. Um, but I, I was never part of that protest movement, partly because I, I was deeply suspicious of the, of the hard left who seemed to be leading it. Those debates began earlier. I was at one in 1965, right, I'm sure, which Christopher yeah. Hill yeah. Um, chaired right. and on the same subject. Right, right. Um, well, I arrived in Oxford in '65, so uh, so uh, it was the, mm. uh, through that period. And then I arrived back in England at the end of 1970, and had to get a job, which seemed to me, um, in those far off days, one sort of assumed that jobs would turn up somewhere. Mm. Um, and I went for an interview in the city, and that didn't seem to be at Warburg's. I was interviewed by Eric Rowell, who just arrived at Warburg's, great former civil servant. Um, he wasn't the economic historian. The, the economic historian yeah. as well, yes. A uh, uh, formidable man who lived mm. to be very nearly 100. Mm. And I came back, I, at the end of my political life, I did work for Warburg's. Um, <laughs> and he was still there in, in his <laughs> mid-90s. Um, wonderful man, actually. And that book was, has never been out of print, I believe. No, it's an excellent yeah. book. Um, uh, I then I had an interview at the Bank of England. I remember being taken through those great corridors with people in pink frock coats and the old-fashioned way. Neither of those seemed very exciting to me, and I had a sort of F.E. Smith approach to money. I thought money would come from somewhere, normally from my long-suffering father, so I didn't <laughs> think I had to go and, and earn a fortune. Um, and then I was uh, in the, with my father in the 
um, this must have been early 1971, in the um, guest room of the House of Lords, and the most frightful piece of nepotism happened. George Jellicoe, who was the Conservative, who was then in the government, um, uh, Lord Privy Seal, or presiding in the Cabinet Office over a range of things, but including uh, Ted Heath's plans for the reform of the structure of Whitehall. Uh, I was having a drink with my father, and George came over and said, uh, what are you doing to me? So I said, well, I couldn't find anything very interesting. And he said, Victor's looking for chaps. And Victor was, um, who I'd never heard of, was um, Victor Rothschild, who had just been appointed to run a unit in the cabinet office called the Central Policy Review Staff, which was going to be a new structured policy analysis unit uh, consisting half of insiders. Uh, oh, uh, all the members became established, temporarily established civil servants, if they weren't civil servants already. It was going to be half proper professional civil servants and part irregulars whom Victor was charged with bringing in from outside. So I went, I went to see Victor Rothschild um, and got a job in the so-called think tank. I think partly because he had recently asked the civil service department to send him some young people and they'd sent him a whole lot of 40-year-olds and he, having run research, um, scientific research establishments, thought that young people meant 23-year-olds and so I, I think he then gave me a job with my long hair, no experience at all, partly I think to warn the civil service unless they tried a bit harder, this is what they'd get. So, um, <laughs> you did have long hair at that time. I had sort of Bob Dylan type hair, yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, but it was a wonderful unit, it was the first year and a half or so we had terrific fun, it was very, very high grade people. I shared a room with a um, young treasury civil servant called Robin Butler, who mm. just became head of the civil service and cabinet mm. secretary. Um, there was Robert Wade Gary, who became who from the Foreign Office, became High Commissioner in India. There was Peter Carey, who became Permanent Secretary in the Department of Trade and Industry. There was clever John Guinness, who was a civil servant then, Foreign Office, but subsequently in the Energy Department. William Plowden, um, uh, Adam Ridley from outside. There, it, was, it was a wonderfully talented group of people, much ridiculed by the by private eye for being all toffs and and, and um, uh, friends of Victor's, and for a time we did really quite uh, good work. I think um, Robert Wade Geary described it as in a, in a pamphlet as um, throwing grit into the smooth running of the machine, which is sometimes <laughs> necessary. And we were put there to sort of a, a, a stir up trouble and ask uh, um, unanswerable questions. Um, um, we, and we looked at a whole range of things from race relations to Concord to uh, how to how to uh, build more coordinated social policy, many of the issues that go on forever. Um, and f uh, we, above all, we, uh, uh, from my point of view at any rate, we twice a year would take the cabinet away to checkers and give them a sort of situation report on how we thought they were doing in a very impertinent and, and uh, iconoclastic way. We used to stick up charts with uh, end-of-term reports, you know, housing <laughs> three out of ten, you know, foreign <laughs> policy six out of ten. And the ministers more or less put up with it. They put up with it at any rate until um, uh, the government began to get into serious trouble and the great strikes and, th and things. And then in the autumn of 73, when everything began to go wrong, um, it lost influence. This is Heath's. And this was, of course, Heath's, Heath's government, government, yes, in yeah. 74. And in, in the autumn of 73, I'd become quite well known to Ted Heath because we saw a lot of the Prime Minister uh, in the CPRS. Um, I left the civil service and was appointed understudy to Douglas Hurd, who was his political secretary um, in number 10. Uh, the theory was there'd be an election in about 75 um, and I'd have an 18 month run in. But then came the, the winter of 73 4 with the miners' strike and um, three day week and so on. Uh, 
Heard went off and got a seat in Oxfordshire as a parliamentary candidate, so I was pitched in as the parliamentary secretary in the middle of the crisis, very inexperienced really, and was there through the first election, the February election of 74, uh, which in which he got more votes than any other party, but um, didn't have an overall majority spent three days negotiating with the Liberals and then resigned and Wilson, rather to his astonishment, came back to power. Um, I continued to work, run Heath's office in opposition between the two elections of 74. Um, the second election of 74, we lost again, of course, but not so badly as people had predicted. Um, it's often not noticed that Heath, having fought a rather good rearguard action in that second 74 election, left a situation where um, the Labour government in the end had to make a deal with the Liberals, so they called Lib Lab Pact mm -hmm. in 77 and 78, and after the loss of various by-elections were actually defeated in the House of Commons. So his, he, he fought a good campaign uh, then, but he was of course becoming more and more unpopular in his party. The party was shifting in economic terms to the right, uh, the rise of Keith Joseph, the sort of people who had been uh, thought of as very outré and, and old-fashioned in the Institute for Economic Affairs, um, Ralph um, Selden and uh, um, Harris uh, began to be at the centre of things, liberal economics coming of a fairly primitive kind in a way began to come back into fashion. Um, and. Um, uh, the rumblings against Heath from the party, which were not so much ideological, the Conservative Party just doesn't like not winning, and um, he he had, um, having won a, a, an unexpected and stunning victory in '70, appeared then to have sort of squandered it by by um, losing control of the situation, famous U-turns and so on. So there was much discontent. He was an awkward man, it was strange really. Philip Ziegler has written a very good recent biography of him uh, in which he addresses this point of how a man who could have been a popular young officer in the war, an extremely effective chief whip at the time of Suez, keeping the party together, all those skills seemed to desert him uh, as, uh, when he became Prime Minister and he, he behaved in a very sort of apolitical way in relation to his own party, very unwilling to do the basic sort of um, uh, manoeuvring and, and lobbying that you need to do as the leader of a democratic party. So various people then began to be put forward as candidates against him. Edward Dukan, rather implausibly, was chairman mm -hmm. of the 1922 committee and had a rather dubious record in the city. Um, then Keith Joseph, who made a series of brave but not very politically wise speeches which were much ridiculed at the time. Um, some of the ideas have now come back into fashion again but he put forward the idea of a, a cycle of deprivation through the generations which um, was taken at the time as meaning that there was a, a sort of genetic underclass and that was much ridiculed. So he blew up. And then Margaret Thatcher who, who um, was then not not quite as ideological as her uh, supporters later thought, but she was new. She had a she had a very skillful uh, operation campaigning for her, um, run by Airy Neve, whose basic basic um, campaign strategy was to say to people, "There's not a chance of her being elected, but we really must give Ted a warning." There are lots of people who voted for her and they won on the first ballot. It was brilliant. You know. <laughs> and I don't think the Conservative Party quite knew what, the, what, what they'd done. But um, anyway, Ted then uh, was What, what was your reaction? Exactly. Well, I was intensely loyal to, to him. I was running his office and part of his mm. campaign. Uh, I resigned before I could be sacked from running the leader's office. Obviously, mm. Mrs. Thatcher was good. She going to uh, um, have her own team. She uh, she t treated me with great sort of courtesy. She didn't think, uh, um, you know, she understood that I'd been working for the leader of the, of the, of the day. Um, and um, so after he lost the leadership, that was 75, middle of 75, um, uh, uh, I resigned and left um, the sort of political world. 
I had accompanied Heath in 74, between the two elections, to China on a famous and strange trip. Chinese not a bit bothered by the fact that he appeared to be out of power. They, they th- assumed that his career would go on for another 40 years, as their <laughs> leaders did. What was your impression of China at that well, time? Well, it was an extraordinary time. Mao Zedong, was, we met Mao Zedong, um, and we were the, the leader of the government, the effective leader of the negotiations and talks that we took part in was Zhou Enlai. Uh, Deng Xiaoping had just been brought back from exile and was sort of sitting in the corner of the room. So power was beginning to move, but nothing had changed really yet. The Cultural Revolution had ended, um, but there were signs everywhere of sort of the strangeness of the place. Wherever we went, there were thousands of people clapping as we went past, and Douglas Hurd, who speaks Mandarin, said you could hear the the microphone, the, the, the loudspeakers in the background telling people to go and clap. They had no idea who we were or what, what they were doing. I remember going to a school, we were shown a primary school, which was a, a rather scholarly old gentleman who was teaching basic reading to small children. So Ted, who was very good at, at not accepting con- the constraints of a, of, a, of, a, of a trip like that, insisted on asking what he'd been doing before the Cultural Revolution, much to the embarrassment of, of the hosts. And that he'd been teaching Chaucer in the university, so you sort of suddenly had a flash of, of the destruction of people's of, of a culture and of people's lives. Did you have any sense of the devastating effects of the Great Leap Forward and so on? Well, it was it was it was very um, all that was of course disguised from us. But yes, there were odd and peculiar things, half-built buildings and things everywhere, which were all said to be now not half-built buildings at all, but. Um, uh, shelters against the uh, incoming Russian missiles, because this was the time when th- there was a, 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 a tremendous conference, which is why they'd invited Ted. They were extremely anti-Russian at this point, mm. so anybody who was anti-Russian in Europe was their friend. That's why mm. they were making up to British conservatives. <coughs> but you had a sense um, of, of half-finished things everywhere, and of, but you didn't see. I mean, the, it, well, we weren't shown, obviously, and we were things were kept from us. Um, you didn't actually see hunger, or, or but you you felt the, the, the attention everywhere, um, uh, and the journalists who travelled with us were always on the lookout for um, signs of the Cultural Revolution breaking out again, and so on. And you did, we were told you could see things written on the walls attacking local officials, and so on. So it was, it was still t- a, a tense period, I think, but it was the beginning of the great change because mm-hmm. Deng Xiaoping, of course, effectively was the successor who changed mm-hmm. everything. But it was extraordinary. We arrived after a long, long flight, not knowing what to expect at all, but what we then called Peking, um, to get out of our aeroplane to see a sea in all direction of, of children with, with um, uh, flags and bunting and everything, thousands and thousands of them with banners reading solidarity between the People's Republic of China and the Conservative Party of Great Britain. <laughs> the whole thing was surreal from, from start to end. I remember being struck by we were taken to Kunming in the West and we were shown how, how happy the Tibetans were, not actually in formal Tibet, but in the Tibetan ethnic region, with people who were clearly Han Chinese dressed up as Tibetans doing Tibetan dances. So they knew what we were sensitive about and they were very careful to try and we went to one of those execrable uh, modern communist, uh, Chinese communist um, sort of ballet operas, mm. w- which had names like the bringing of electricity to the province of somewhere or other. Anyway, <laughs> taken a, I remember our hostess was the famous Madame Ma. So it was a strange, surreal mm. interlude. Mm. Um, anyway, in 75, I found myself out of job again. Um, and this time I thought as part of my sort of slightly self-conscious prince's education, I must go and learn about real industry. So I kept clear of the city again. I was offered generously by Henry Keswick, who just bought The Spectator, to be the political editor of The Spectator, but I thought journalism was a very low activity and I was going to be much more important than that. So I took a very menial job, actually, with Arnold Weinstock, then boss of the great General Electric Company. I worked in his office for a bit, and I was sent out to have a junior job in a factory in, in Leicester, which made gas turbines. 
And I did learn a bit about uh, about how the then existing British heavy and en- heavy engineering sector worked. It's all been destroyed now by the people who ruined that company later. Um, but uh, I never ran a, a, a unit in the company. I was about to be given a little company to run when the uh, Labour government began to lose its ma- overall majority and the Conservatives began to look for candidates much earlier in the in the electoral cycle than usual, not, not sort of a year before the, the final date of the election, but it could have been elected at any time. And so I started putting my name forward for Conservative seats and was selected for one in Bristol uh, in 19, uh, the end of 76 or beginning of 77. So at that point my life became very old because I couldn't really be given any proper job in the company. Were you married by this time? Uh, I married in 77, yes, so that was the other great, great change. Mm. Um, and uh, when I was working in Leicester, I used to drive a long triangle around to London where Caroline was to before we were married and to Bristol where my future seat was um, and then back to Leicester where I was working in the week so it was a very exhausting um, time. And then we were married in 77 and that began to change everything again because then Weinstock gave me a job back in the headquarters in London and um, my parents gave us a house to live in, and so our sort of my grown-up life <laughs> began, as it yeah. were. Your parents died, did you say? No, no, mm-hmm. my no, my parents lived long for a long time. They both died in 1995. Oh, right. um, no, my parents gave us a house in London to live in, yeah. um, and um, we set about um, setting up house and so on. Then the election came in '79, and I was elected in that. Um, with a, a pretty big majority in Bristol West. I got more than 50% of the vote for the only time that I did. Um, and cause it was at that time it was a seat where the Liberals were more of a challenge to the Conservatives than Labour, and Labour's vote was very low. <coughs> and a lot of people voted Conservative, who didn't vote Conservative again, actually. Um, and so then I was in Parliament, and that was another big watershed moment in my life, obviously. Um, I came in in 79 with a, quite a range of quite talented people. It was often forgotten that Thatcher's uh, um, manifesto in 79 bore very little relation to what subsequently happened. It was a moderate manifesto, safe manifesto, largely written by the Conservative Research Department led by Chris Patton, who was a, a sort of middle of the road person, a friend of mine. And um, her first cabinet contained many old Macmillanite and Heathite people, Soames and Gilmore, and as well as Carrington and Whitelaw and Hailsham. And, um, and as we're now learning in 2013, as Charles Moore's biography came out, her, uh, and as we knew at the time, her position was extremely shaky. Um, the, the economy, she'd been elected after the the, um, uh, the so-called winter of discontent, which was a horrible time, as you remember, with um, public sector unions controlling access to hospitals, with grave diggers on strike, with corruption, and the, uh, Caroline's business partner, Prudleith, caused <laughs> helped to cause a major dustbin striking in London by refusing to pay the bribes that the brothers demanded to empty the dustbins. It was a, we were, it was the time when Sir Nicholas Henderson, our ambassador in France, wrote his valedictory dispatch, which was then leaked, saying um, that it was a matter of, uh, it was, uh, to represent Britain abroad was a humiliating process, that we were the sick man of Europe and regarded as a joke. And it was a very low period of, 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 of national morale. Heath's government had effectively been driven out by the, by the leaders of the big unions. So had Jim Callaghan. So Jim Callaghan had tried to do the same sort of deals on pay and productivity, and had also been defeated. So, um, in a, in a, there were many. It was a fashionable thing to say that the country was ungovernable and so on. Mm. And the first strike that Mrs. Thatcher faced, she gave in to the first electricity strike, 
um, but she then began to prepare. She she was a, she was a sort of not really an ideological person. She was she saw what she knew, and she was uh, in Isaiah Berlin's distinction between hedgehogs and foxes. She was a complete fox. I mean, she just knew things from her own direct experience. She thought it intolerable that governments were being made outside um, the electoral process, and that the only way to deal with this was. Um, to have a confrontation with the big organized unions, and they gave it to her, um, mm. um, with uh, Scargill leading famously the coal strike without taking a ballot from his own members. And she had, having been beaten in the first electricity strike, she had prepared meticulously with the help of the old Central Gen Electricity Generating Board led by Sir Walter Marshall. They had coal stocks prepared, they had cranes turned around in the dock so you could import coal. I mean, they were ready for it and they beat it. And it was very rough and very tough um, because she was, as it were, reversing nearly 20 years of sort of appeasement in this sector, which made it far worse when you had to deal with it. People say, well, Germans got rid of their, their coal mines without all this trouble and so did the French, um, and that is perfectly true because they hadn't been subsidising them to nearly the same extent and they'd had a long period of running them down. Mm -hmm. If we'd been doing that, we'd have done better. But we didn't, and, and she was right to say that there was no alternative, I believe, at that point. Um, her famous budget of 1981 um, uh, was attacked by 300 and something 50 economists in the <laughs> Times newspaper, including the present governor of the Bank of England, who was rather shamefaced when you remind him of it, and said that it would all lead to disaster. And it didn't. They did rebalance the economy by not really cutting public expenditure dramatically, but sitting on its growth, cutting taxes uh, in the end to allow incentives to the private sector, and in the end, private sector jobs, the system worked. Um, I was quite nervous about all this. I, um, I was more clear that her economic policy was right than most of my friends. I was somewhat to the right on economic policy, partly because of the experience I'd gone through with Ted Heath, where, uh, and I knew it couldn't work again. He'd gone to the other extreme of trying to manage a planned economy with statutory pay and prices and everything. I knew that couldn't work. Um, I thought from my experience working for Weinstock that there was no alternative to being tough. Uh, we had a little dining group called the Blue Chips, Chris Patton and John Patton and myself and John Major and Matthew Paris and various others, where it was a microcosm of the sort of arguments that were going on across the party. But I was more robust than Chris Patton, who was the other sort of main leader of the group who was uh, more consensual on economic policy. And we weren't influential, but we were having the same argument that everybody else was having. And the, the key to our success, of course, was the, the, the Labour Party moved to the left and split, and that although David Owen and the Social Democrats would never ally with her, they were uh, absolutely essential in, in, in dividing the, the left vote and stopping anybody stopping her, if you see what I mean. Um, and then came the Falklands. As a matter of fact, the Poles had begun slightly to recover before the Falklands, but the huge gamble of the Falklands, which showed her courage, sort of changed the nature of, the relation, of her relationship with the British, I think, because even people who disliked her then began their sentences by saying, well, you have to hand it to her. <laughs> and I remember the banner that the Tommies, uh, the soldiers, uh, squaddies on, on uh, hung over the side of Canberra, the line as she came back, um, Maggie rules okay, at which point it was clear we were going to win that next election, which we did. And I had become a junior minister in the education department um, fairly early on, 1981, under Keith Joseph, um, at a time when uh, university spending, well, my job was higher education and university spending was to be, well it wasn't actually to be cut but the growth was to be uh, curtailed, which I have to say the previous Labour government under Shelley Williams had warned was inevitable but um, there was a most tremendous uproar wherever, wherever I went. Um, I was responsible for appointing Peter Swinnerton Dyer to be head of the 
um, UGC. the UGC because he believed that the cut should be shaped and, and mm. excellence should be uh, attempted to be preserved. And he made very heavy cuts in, in, in some universities, curious enough, and, and lesser in others. The ones that got cut most, the famously Salford and Aston, uh, pulled themselves together and responded better mm. than, for example, my university of Bristol, which had rather minor cuts, which just cut everything across the board. And it was in a typical university where they couldn't make up their mind about what to do. Um, and um, actually, by today's standards, it was all fairly mild. I remember going to California to uh, Berkeley, where there was a famous sort of continuous seminar about higher education, which I went to run by an Englishman, actually, Fulton, son of the of the um, of Lord Fulton of the civil service reforms. And I remember being introduced by him to the American audience saying, now here's Mr. Walgrave who has come along to explain to us how the British education system works. They have 17% of their people, mostly middle class, in the university system. And they're paid for by the working class. And this is a wonderful system that the British have, and he'll explain <laughs> why it's a good one. Which, of course, was broadly the truth. We had a very selective small system, very generous to those who were within it, paid for by the basic taxpayer, and it wasn't mm. sustainable in the long term, particularly if we were going to expand the, um, our education to a proper uh, participation level. I had one unfashionable, um, so I, I, um, although it was very painful, I didn't I find myself uh, thinking that this, this was incredibly wicked, I thought that we were going to have to change. Um, I did have one thing which ran counter to the culture of the day and was soon swept away. I tried to protect the separation between the polytechnics and, and the universities. I thought there was a separate role for much more locally rooted and much more vocational uh, institutions. Um, and there was huge lobbying from the heads of the polytechnics, all to become vice-chancellors and, and, and be grand. Uh, I invented a sort of partnership between government and local government, um, which for a couple of years stopped them being wholly nationalised, but then Kenneth Baker later came along and, and they all became universities. I still think it was actually a mistake. Mm. The idea that there's only one mission for a university seems to me a little bit crazy. Mm. Um, so then I did, a, so I did th that painful job for a couple of years where there were literally riots wherever, wherever I went quite often. And then I was moved to the Department of the Environment where I had a lovely time, it's still at parliamentary secretary level, because green policies, uh, environmental policy had been asleep through the long recession. We were now beginning to recover from recession. This is a normal cycle. Pe when people are poor, you, you, there's not much money to go around to look after the climate and the environment. Um, so it was all coming back to life again and I enjoyed that and and did it and was involved in getting sensible, some sensible beginnings of reform to the common agricultural policy, for example, that had more environmental objectives in it. We had, the, we were overshadowed by the continuing row about uh, acid rain, which the Scandinavians, and le much less plausibly the Germans, said that their forests were being damaged by wicked British uh, uh, sulfur dioxide coming out of our big coal-fired power stations. The Germans had no case for that at all. They were being damaged by, by uh, if they were being damaged by acid rain from Bohemia, but not from us. Scandinavians had more of, more of a, uh, a case, and I was keen to get our policy changed, which it was in the end. But uh, after the coal strike had been defeated and the Nottinghamshire coal miners had helped us to defeat it, putting up the price of coal by putting through gas desulphurization on our coal fire, remaining coal-fired power stations was, of course, not easy. Um, but it happened slowly in the end. Um, and there was the beginning, so that was one big issue. There was the issue of CFCs in the atmosphere, um, uh, damaging the ozone layer, which Mrs. Thatcher was extremely quick to understand. She understood the chemistry of these issues. I had the, I had the whole being discovered it was it. identified, luckily for for British um, science, by the British Antarctic Survey, or yes, they played a big Cambridge. part in, in Cambridge, exactly. And Mrs. Thatcher was in favour of that, because A, it was chemistry, and B, it was the British science. <laughs> but also, she, she understood it. I mean, people came and explained it to her, and she could see the point, and put Britain quite swiftly in mm. the leading role in that. So the idea that she was sort of anti-environmentalist was, was much too... 
easy. She, if the thing was scientifically uh, uh, convincing, she would she would accept it. Um, I stayed in the Department of the Brand for five years, doing all sorts of jobs. Um, I did the environment job. I was then Minister of Local Government. I'll come back to that. And after the 87 election, I was made Minister of Housing um, and took the legislation, which again I believed in, of liberalizing the rented sector, getting more investment into the rented sector, which has worked through very controversial at the time, doing away with the old um, slump, somewhat absurd um, uh, systems of leases, which are, uh, led to the situation where I remember Julian Amory had a protected tenancy in Belgrave Square, which he lived in, which is all a little bit bonkers, really. Um, and that was sensible. But then came the most, perhaps the most important episode in my life, in which, <laughs> well, let's go back a little bit. In the second election of 1974, there was a tremendous uh, pressure on um, the Conservative Party, uh, Heath in opposition, and on the government, there was much a lesser pressure on the government to do something about the domestic rates, which were of huge importance in the home counties and in the Conservative heartlands. Ted Heath was pressured into saying in the second election of 1974 that the Conservative Party would abolish the domestic rate. It wasn't said what would replace it, but it would abolish the domestic rate. This was popular in Conservative heartlands. The pledge was given to our then environment spokesman, uh, Secretary, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for the Environment, to campaign with, namely Margaret Thatcher. She had a very good election on the back of this pledge in 1974. Fast forward then to 1983-4, and the whole issue was coming up again. Callaghan had postponed the revaluation of the rates a couple of times and so it had all gone to sleep but it was becoming absolutely apparent that if the old rating system with its rating poundages was to continue there had to be a revaluation of people's properties which meant that the rates the uh, the burden of rates as the system was meant to do would be shifted to places where property had gone up in value and, and uh, somewhat lessened on places where probably gone down in value, which more or less coincided with Labour and Conservative areas of voting. So the Conservatives, particularly in Scotland, were in a complete panic about this revaluation and brought huge pressure to bear on um, Margaret Thatcher to uh, fulfil Heath's pledge from 74, which had been somewhat sidelined in the intervening period, to abolish the domestic rate. Um, I was the junior minister in charge of the immensely complex rate support grant system in the uh, in the um, Department of the Environment. And in an arrogant and ambitious way, I went to see her and said, I can invent you something better, accompanied by my permanent secretary, not by my secretary of state, Patrick Jenkins. And I set up here, you know, just before that, I'd been rung up by Tess Rothschild saying that her husband was extremely bored and could I find a job for him. So I said to Margaret Thatcher, who liked Rothschild, um, I'll get Victor and we'll set up a team rather like the old CPRS and we'll look into the whole thing and we'll come up with a, something. Hence was born the unit and it was, um, which uh, produced the poll tax or the community charge. Um, and um, in 1986 it was adopted by a cabinet I had produced a package of nationalising the uh, non-domestic rate, um, simplifying the grants and having a flat charge, uh, pretending that this wasn't a tax but was a charge for services and called it the community charge. Nigel Lawson, the Treasury, was always opposed to it but was sort of bored with the whole subject. The, the main campaigner with, inside government who said it was all wrong was Heseltine and the, and the cabinet which adopted it as policy was the cabinet out of which Heseltine walked, um, having uh, as a result of the complicated and now almost incomprehensible Westland affair in which he quarrelled with the Prime Minister and lay on Britain uh, 
the Attorney General about helicopters and resigned. Mm. And with a beautiful symmetry, that cabinet was the one which then adopted my policy, which had actually been put before the electorate in the 87 election. Well, no, the, the, that cabinet was before the it was in 86. Uh, so they adopted it, white paper was published, or green paper first, a white paper, consultative, a white paper, manifesto commitment, and uh, we won that election of 87. And I was by then moved to housing, and others had to take the consequences. Uh, and Nicholas Ridley became Secretary of State, followed by my old friend Chris Patton, and they put the thing into action. Um, it was put into action at the same time that Nigel Lawson took the opportunity of cutting income tax uh, dramatically and cutting the grants to local authorities, so that the, it had a much sharper impact, both in terms of perception of unfairness, because here were dustmen being charged the same as Dukes, and the Dukes' income tax was being cut, and the grants were being cut, so that the whole weight of, of locally raised expenditure went up. So if we'd wanted to make it as unpopular as possible, we did, and it <laughs> was. <laughs> um, and um, so that was all my own work, but yeah. I mean, it, it's arrogant to say it was all my own work, but it was I, the, the original package of measures which Nigel Lawson in his memoirs always calls the Walgrave reforms, it was produced by me. It then was uh, uh, examined and put through every conceivable uh, uh, part of the government sort of decision-taking machine, including a general election. So, But I, I genuinely think that if I'd come back after that unit with Rothschild and said, there's nothing to be done, we've got to go on, or we've got to have a um, some form of... Um, local income tax or something, probably nothing would have happened. It was because we produced a convincing and rather speciously coherent uh, uh, thing, which fitted with some other right-wing views. Alan Walters, her, her economic um, advisor who caused Nigel Lawson to resign, was in favour of it, and Norman Tebbit was in favour, and the Scots were in favour of it. They thought it was wonderful. <laughs> Uh, but of course it was then seen by the, and they, they said could we have it first George mm -hmm. Younger the Secretary of State incredibly anxious to get it quickly into Scotland to rescue the poor Tory party in Scotland which was in trouble had the exact opposite effect and left the Scots with the firm belief that they'd been used as the guinea pig uh, which wasn't uh, well they had in one sense but only because the Scottish Conservatives had asked for it um, so I became Minister of Housing did the housing reform reform bill and then in the um, uh, and then 1988 was moved to the absolute dream job at that time of being Minister of State in the Foreign Office um, this was a wonderful two years of hope the ending of the Berlin Wall came down Mandela was released um, Rabin seemed to be leading positive uh, uh, policies in Israel which and there was a response from the PLO. I went to see Arafat in Tunis because he had uh, promised to renounce terrorism and engage in democratic dialogue with the Israelis. And it was a fascinating and absolutely wonderful period. And I had a sort of grandstand um, seat at um, you know one of the one of the times when it was a joy to be alive and met all these famous people and Mandela and. Um, Valencia and Gorbachev and de Klerk and, and um, uh, Arafat and the Israelis and so on. So, and, and British prestige was high at that time. The, uh, she, Margaret Thatcher's role in the building of trust with Gorbachev, often written about but true, partly because we had a very good um, defector in Oleg Gordievsky who told her early on that Gorbachev was quite different from the other people. Um, and um, The relations with America were... The relations with America were very strong. For example, when I went to see Arafat in Tunis, that was partly at the request of the Americans. The Americans wanted to respond to uh, what Arafat had said, uh, but they, their own congressional as locks wouldn't let them send a senior person to see him, so you know. So it was done in absolute uh, parallel with them. 
the only time we fell off the rails was uh, over the reunification of Germany, where she had visceral views about... She had one sensible view, which was real, which was we had to be extremely careful not to humiliate Gorbachev and that the Russians felt differently about Germany than they did about anywhere else, which was true. But the Americans were handling that skillfully and and she, but, and she, she got herself in a very weak position actually trying to block something that was completely inevitable, stirred up often by Mitterrand, who quite mischievously were famously on one occasion came and told her, Margaret, it is autumn 1913, and so, and so she would explode, and then he would go scuttling off to Cole and say, do you know what Margaret said? <laughs> and he just did it for fun. Um, but it wasn't really just for fun, it was the perennial French diplomatic objective of marginalizing Britain in relation to, to uh, Germany. Um, but, and that spoiled things a bit in, in terms of influence at the end, but arriving in Poland or in Czechoslovakia um, or Hungary, her prestige was so high, uh, um, they only really wanted to talk to the Americans and, and us, which, and it was wonderful to be a minister in that, um, at that time. And then came the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein, um, which uh, caught us all by surprise. We were being told by the King of Jordan the night before there was absolutely no chance of it happening. Um, and um, I was the minister for that part of the world and the first person to have to respond and began to respond um, reasonably toughly and was then a key player in the build-up of the beautiful diplomacy which took place then with all proper UN sanction and every alliance, uh, ally you can imagine from Syria to um, Japan were all on side um, and just uh, uh, a that was really well done and that was how to do diplomacy partly because the, the Bush senior diplomatic team was so strong but also because we had good leadership uh, in Britain, and um, everybody was on site, the French were on site. And then one day I was going to and fro to number 10 all the time in the sort of build up for planning this transition to war in the autumn of um, 1990. And I'd been sort of missing the stresses and strains in the Tory party because I was working so hard, often, you know, often sleeping in the office and missing weekends and things. Um, and um, I hadn't been sort of noticing what was, uh, um, so that when Geoffrey, I, I wasn't in the house when Geoffrey Howe made his famous speech about the cricket bat and resigned. Um, and I, so I was summoned over to number 10 for yet another meeting I thought about whether the tanks had the right equipment or whatever it was and went into Mrs. Thatcher's uh, study where she said that, um, I wanted to be Secretary of State for Health, uh, and um, Kenneth, she said, Kenneth Clark, stirred them all up, and I wanted to calm them all down. Um, and so, to my astonishment and horror, I became Secretary of State for Health, the subject which I knew was a nightmare, it was a sort of hospital pass for any Conservative, really. And uh, I knew nothing about it at all, had no background. <laughs> and so arrived in the Cabinet um, that way, her last appointment because within a month or so um, uh, uh, um, the leadership, Heseltine's leadership challenge was launched and it was the nightmare of, of um, those last days which were horrible with sort of, you know, sort of this wounded titan and all sort of sharks circling, mm -hmm. I, it was really horrible. Um, were you part of the group that decided her fate? No, not really. I mean, I wasn't powerful enough. I mean, I was in the cabinet, so her, um, her, uh, what happened was she, uh, she just didn't get enough votes under the complicated Tory system. She won, but didn't get enough votes on the first ballot. You had to have a, a weighted majority. Um, and at that point, it became absolutely clear that she wouldn't win on the second ballot, that all sorts of people who were sitting on their hands and watching would, would now move to um, 
move again, away from her in the second ballot. And the battle, the, 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 then all her remaining supporters be, uh, pressed her to, to stand down because they thought that if, if Heseltine was the only candidate, if it was her versus Heseltine in the second ballot, Heseltine might win, which would be a complete disaster as far as they were concerned. Um, and that, therefore she'd got to stand down in favour of someone less bad than Heseltine. We were all, um, she interviewed the whole cabinet one by one that, that next day, horrible process. I was the last, as the most junior. And we all said what was the truth, I think, that um, she wouldn't win in the second ballot. Um, uh, but it was horrible, the whole thing. The sort of glee, people with this sort of bogus excitement and sort of, uh, it was all horrible. And in retrospect, it was a terrible thing, I think, actually. Um, she should have, she should have gone a little bit earlier. She was beginning to be uh, sort of rackety, but it was at the moment of almost her greatest triumph. The reason she was in Paris was for the meeting of the uh, uh, Organization of European Cooperation, I think it was called, which was the really where the the, the Cold War was declared to be over. I mean, um, it shouldn't have been done like that. Uh, husband's view, I think, was that she should have retired a little bit earlier, but anyway, it was horrible. I mean, politics is sometimes horrible. I then supported Douglas Hurd in the, in the um, uh, uh, leadership election, as did a good many of my friends. John Major was her anointed candidate, she wrongly thinking that he was a, a, a sort of natural right-winger, which he wasn't. Um, I, I got used to being overtaken by Chris Patton in my generation, but I hadn't quite stomached the idea of being overtaken by John Major <laughs> as well. So my opposition to him was partly based on jealousy, I should think, but partly also on the, uh, an understanding, which I think may well have been true, that he was too decent and, and sort of sane a person to make mm. a, a prime minister. You had to be very old to be a successful prime minister, and he's not old. He's an exceptionally mm. nice and decent man. Um, uh, and a great public servant, but I didn't think he he would make a good prime minister. And I said so. Um, he, when he was elected, very loyally confirmed me in my post. Um, and we had the '92 election, which, by his sort of courage and and di and, and the dignified way in which he carried himself, as opposed to Kinnock. Mm. Um, the electorate warmed to him and elected him with a huge number of votes, so not a very big majority. He got many more votes than Margaret Thatcher had ever got, but not mm. many seats. Um, and that election was, of course, a crucial one for the balance of politics in Britain because the Labour Party then came to the conclusion that it really did have to change itself into being a more centrist Social Democrat party. Well, I think we'd got to the 1992 election, which yeah. was a fairly rough election for me. I was Secretary of State for Health. Labour was making an attack on the Conservatives' health reforms, the centrepiece, really, of its campaign. They had a very able uh, spokesman, Robin Cook, who, and the, the, there was a major sort of fracas during the election to do with one of their advertising um, campaigns. It was called The War of Jennifer's Ear by the um, <laughs> press because there was a little girl who had grommets and was she going to be treated much more quickly in the private sector and we were trying to privatise everything and it was all disgraceful. And I didn't do very well, but it was a sort of score draw, as they say in football. They were retreated off the, off the health service ground in the last, uh, uh, last week and we, lost, we won the election. Um, the BBC had two outside broadcast units at my account with their social affairs correspondent Polly Toynbee in charge because they'd analysed that we were going to lose the election and we were going to lose it because of my health reforms. And I remember having the pleasure of walking across to Polly during the course of the evening as it became clearer and clearer that the opposite was going to happen um, and saying, when are we going on the air, Polly? I want to be interviewed. And I wasn't interviewed once. <laughs> I think if we'd lost, I would be. Anyway. Um, so I didn't have a 
uh, I'm not a great knockabout electoral politician, but we, John Major won that election. Um, I was then given a sort of mixed portfolio to do with reform of civil service and reform of government, or the Citizens' Charter, which was the big idea of the day, and also responsibility for science and technology policy, which I much enjoyed. And my career was sort of doing a flattening. It wasn't going up, but it wasn't going down particularly. And I had reasonable expectation of further promotion, I suppose. Um, and when everything went wrong for me in a rather terminal way, which uh, uh, involves going backwards a bit, or at least uh, it started, the trigger for it was uh, a dinner um, given by the Prime Minister for Yeltsin, the Russian successor to Gorbachev, in the Painted Hall at Greenwich, tremendous occasion. I remember afterwards, after the dinner, Robin Butler, the head of the Civil Service Cabinet Secretary, coming up to me and saying, do you remember that trial to do with the export of lathes to Iraq? The Matrix Churchill, the company was called. I faintly remembered something about it. Um, and he said, well, it's collapsed, because Alan Clark says, uh, it's, uh, uh, under cross-examination, had said that the government was encouraging them to export against the formal policy. There'll have to be an inquiry. So I said, oh, all right. I didn't remember very much about it. I remembered that the Foreign Office had been um, the one department in Whitehall arguing to limit uh, exports to Iraq. This was in the run-up to the first Gulf War, uh, right back in 1998 um, and 99, uh, 88 and 89. It's all a long time ago. And I didn't really think all that much more about it, but the, the trial did collapse. The people were acquitted. They had been accused of, of uh, signing, uh, of lying in, their, uh, in what they'd said to the Department of Trade and Industry about their export licenses, what the purpose of the lathes that they were exporting to Iraq was. Uh, they had written that they, they were for civil purposes, customs, as the prosecuting authority had argued that they were actually for weapons manufacture. And uh, Alan Clark, under cross-examination, had said, oh, well, nobody cared about this at all in government anyway, and uh, they could." Be, I, I told them they could export what they liked. So there was a tremendous inquiry. I argued that it should be as wide as possible, because I thought that the Foreign Office and myself, vainly, had been on the right side of the argument. But uh, uh, Sir Richard Scott, the distinguished civil lawyer was put in charge of a non-judicial inquiry which rambled on for three or four years. In the middle of it, he sent to us, to those witnesses um, who uh, were going to be criticised, the draft of what he, how he was going to criticise us. This was after about two years. By now, I suppose we're in 1995 or somewhere around there. And the, the criticism in his draft um, in his draft, conclusions were very critical of me. They said that I had answered, I'd sent letters to the members of the public saying that certain guidelines for the export of um, uh, dual use of weapons and dual use machinery uh, had been altered secretly. That he said that the guidelines had been altered secretly, and I had written to members of the public saying that they had been not been altered, which has nothing to do incidentally with the export of weapons. No weapons were exported at all, they were always turned down. It was to do with items like uh, machine tools, which could they or could they not have been used for the manufacture of weapons. And when I read those uh, draft uh, conclusions, I sort of instinctively knew that my political career had really come to an end because uh, I was accused of lying to the public. Um, I, knew, I thought, and I still think I was innocent, um, that these draft uh, conclusions, which were supposed to be very, very confidential for comment by the people who were criticised to allow them to defend themselves, were then leaked by somebody to the BBC, to ITV, and to a couple of newspapers. It was all over the press. 
And I then, um, I thought, you know, I, I never really recovered from this. As a matter of fact, various friends of mine, look, watching all this, came to help me. Above all, uh, um, Lenny Hoffman, Lord Justice Hoffman, who came to see me, I was the Minister of Agriculture by then, and said, you need help in this, this is, you're being treated unfairly, and I'd like to help, who is your solicitor? And so I said, well, I have a, uh, a fifth of a, a nice young solicitor from the Treasury who is helping me. He said, well, you need a proper solicitor, and he wrote the name, somebody at Allen and Overy, and he said, I will advise you and I'll help. And we then, he then, and the solicitors then turned it round. So that in the end, um, Scott didn't really criticize me at all. He said in a rather incomprehensible paragraph <coughs> that I had written letters which were designedly misleading, but I had no intent to deceive. <laughs> As Peter Taylor, the Lord Chief Justice at the time, who I didn't know at all, but came up to me in a party where we both were and said, for a man, and he'd also accused me, Scott, of being sophistic in some argument I'd used. For a man who says that you wrote letters that were um, designed to mislead but, were, uh, uh, but had no intention to deceive, and then accuse you of being sophistic, seems to me going it a bit. Uh, <laughs> and so in his final report, it wasn't actually too damaging to me. He withdrew these accusations. But the damage had been done because I'd been the leaked conclusions had for two years put me in the middle of a sort of maelstrom of press hostility um, and um, though my colleagues led by John Major were incredibly loyal and stuck by me throughout and I was never sacked I served right through his his government as Minister of Agriculture and as Chief Secretary but these are posts of slightly declining importance after health <coughs> um, I knew that uh, I was never going. I wasn't tough enough to recover from this. So um, that was the S Scott inquiry. It was, it was unfair, I think, and badly handled. Um, and the conspiracy theorists around it that none of the conspiracy theories really work. Um, but uh, it's a complex matter, which is which is is difficult to go into. It was one of those huge surges of, of public sort of anger and sort of distrust of government, if you looked at the facts, um, they were different. The Swedish Institute of Peace Studies did an analysis, having been to Iraq after the Americans had um, uh, um, invaded Iraq years later, and analyzed all the weapons purchases by Iraq, and rounded down um, the British percentage contribution to the arm the arming of Iraq to the nearest whole integer, namely zero. Um, the the armed suppliers were Russia, were France, were China. Um, Britain and America didn't arm Iraq. It's, but it's a very satisfying story mm -hmm. that we armed these horrible people and then had to attack them. But it's not actually true. But it's as I've learned in my political life, it's not the truth that outs. It's the story that conforms to to certain paradigms of stories that, that is, in the end, what's accepted. And it's deeply satisfying to think that our heroic soldiers were only fighting these people because our wicked politicians had supplied them with arms in the first place. They hadn't, actually, but never mind. So I'll never quite shift that. So that, that, that knocked the heart out of my enjoyment of politics. And though my colleagues, the big beasts of the jungle, Heseltine and John Major himself and Kenneth Clark and Chris Patton were incredibly loyal to me and protected me, kept me in in uh, cabinet posts throughout. Um, I knew that the sort of uh, it would never be bright morning again, um, and I I'd come quite close to one of the jobs that I would really have loved, like foreign secretary or home secretary. And I knew I was never going to be promoted again. I then lost my seat in the 1997 Conservative debacle. Um, actually, I had not much worse swing than Portillo or any of the other urban seats, but it was an unpleasant campaign, Labour running Scott against me all the way through the campaign. Um, and so I, my political career came to a, a relatively inglorious end. Um, and so then I had to make another life. I was 50, 
I went to see my usual mentor, Douglas Hurd, who said, well, you're 50, you've got time to climb another mountain. I could have hung about, tried to get myself another seat, gone back in. But I'd been seven years in the cabinet, whatever it was, 15 years or something as a minister. I could see the Conservatives weren't going to be re-elected for at least 10 years. I would then be 60. Just possibly I might be given one more job, but whether it would be an interesting job, and much more likely I wouldn't. And in the meantime, I would be hanging about on the back benches, um, doing um, I'm sure a constituency job, but I would have been wasting a, a decade of my life in a way. So I decided not to. I decided to leave politics, try and get a job. I got a job in the city, the boom years, Warburg's, finally, actually, Climate Benson initially, and then Warburg's gave me jobs. I earned more money than I'd earned in politics, though not as much as the uh, very rich people. And I lived a different kind of life where the, the purpose of what I was doing was not at all important, but it was very well paid. Whereas before, I'd been doing things which, whether I was doing them well or badly, it was hard to argue were not important, and I wasn't very well paid. My father always used to tell me that the, how much people are paid is in inverse relationship to the importance of the job they do, which is a, 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 a trope which is nearly true. Anyway, it certainly worked with me. When I was paid much more, I was doing less important things. Um, and um, but of no unusual interest. I had wonderful holidays with my family and all that sort of thing, and ended you up had children. And with, with children, with four mm. children, um, um, who had been, the eldest of them had been 15, 17 when I um, lost my seat and came to the count. It must have been horrible for her. Nobody expected me to lose my seat except me. Um, and. It can't have been nice for her, but the others were young enough not to be too badly hurt by being the children of, I hope, the children of a politician, uh, latterly an unpopular politician, though it's very difficult for the children of politicians, mm -hmm. and many are damaged, but luckily they were relatively uh, younger. Um, but it is one of the costs of being in the public eye, not just for politicians, for anybody else who's in the public eye, their children get hit by the backwash of it. But they seem to have come through in reasonably good shape. And then just as the um, city and the financial services industry all went into meltdown, I was offered to be promised to eat in my old school and returned here as a relatively what date was safe that? haven. Uh, that was in 2000. Well, I was offered the job first in the end of 2008 and appointed in 2009. So you were in the city for 10 years? 10 years, yeah. I was, yeah. I mean, although you weren't in power, what, what were your reflections on what was happening in politics during those ten years? I, I thought it a very poor period of government, curious enough, because um, after the ejection of Britain from the uh, uh, ERM in, in 1992, um, badly handled, um, a long period of, of good economic uh, management ensued. Kenneth Clark was a great chancellor, um, and for the first few years so was Gordon Brown. All they had to do <laughs> to make our country unassailably strong economically was to increase public spending by a little less than the increase in wealth production each year, and steadily pay down debt and steadily invest more. They didn't do that, they did it for the first couple of years, Labour. Um, but then gave in to the lobbies and were spending two or three times on average um, the underlying growth rate of the economy each year uh, um, uh, in increase in public expenditure, which one watched with great sorrow because it wasn't really very difficult. It wasn't that they had to cut expenditure or anything, they just had to not let it grow ridiculously fast. And they were watching the wrong things. They were watching the inflation rate and deflation was being exported by China in, in, uh, and they were watching um, the, the GDP growth rate which was a wonderful thing to watch we, uh, and they were ignoring public and private indebtedness um, and they caught up with them and they, they weren't of course going to have avoided the global uh, crash of 2008 
but Brit there was absolutely no reason why Britain couldn't have been in the sort of position that Sweden or Australia or, or Canada were in, i.e. a relatively strong position. Um, and I remember going, Gordon Brown used to have as, as both as Chancellor and Prime Minister a sort of great, a great uh, uh, celebration just before Christmas every year in the Treasury where he would invite all the heroes of the day and they were all great American investment bankers and went, they, they, uh, just as it's rash for the Tories to fall in love too much with untrammeled markets it's mad for the centre-left party to do so, and they re they made a frightful mess. And their reputations were largely based on our mistakes. If you look at the, the great reputation of Mandelson and Campbell and all those alleged skillful manipulators, after we the Tories were ejected from the ERM, we went from being about five or six points ahead in all the average of the polls to about 10 to 15 points behind, and we stayed there for the next... 15 years, as <laughs> we did it ourselves, really. It wasn't incomparable skill on the other people's part. And I just think it was a wasted decade. I mean, I don't blame Blair for, for supporting the Americans in Iraq. I think it was a mistake, but I can easily see why, and a Conservative government might easily have done the same thing. I can, what I do blame them for is, is not using that golden period, the longest period of economic growth, um, to do a more fundamental reshaping of the economy, which wouldn't have been very difficult to do. And others did it. Germany did it. Um, and is reaping the rewards now. So it was a, it was a, it was a slightly devil's decade in, in terms of lost opportunity, I think. And Bla but Blair remains a formidably complicated and interesting mm. <laughs> electoral politician, as does Clinton. Both of them sat on top of the boom. Mm. Um, and it would have been remarkable if they hadn't been re-elected in those conditions. But they wasted it. Mm. But it's the most difficult thing of all to say no when there appears to be money everywhere, to say no to the lobbies. Mm. But there we are. So I don't think it was a very glorious period of British political life. Mm. Um, it was a horrible period to be in opposition to the Tories because they didn't know what to say and they had a series of not very satisfactory leaders. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the the lion in the path for them was Europe, which split them down the middle. It still does. Um, so it's quite. <laughs> I I, um, I opted out of a difficult period in my party's history. And before we move on to Eton, um, perhaps I, I wondered if there were any more general reflections you had either on the. British political system, as you saw it well, from the inside. I think its strength, its strength, is the radicalness and the directness of its democracy, which is often not understood. Everything is centred in the House of Commons. It's why I'm very sceptical about uh, House of Lords reform. Uh, I think the way in which accountability and responsibility both rest in the House of Commons, very simply. 1940 May, you know where the power rests. In 1990 autumn, you know where the power rests. It's in the House of Commons. It's why we are always going to be uncomfortable members of the European Union because we we don't see why we should defend why we should um, surrender that effective direct democracy to uh, more remote um, uh, supranational powers. Um, uh, it's why we're sceptical about conventions of human rights and so on. We like uh, to, uh, the danger, maybe dangerous, but we we like having direct control in, uh, in the hands of the people we've elected. That's the plus side. The negative side is the danger of following America. One negative side, anyway, is the danger of following America into in uh, or going back, if you like, almost to the late 17th early 18th century, where there's no boundaries on the, on the savagery of the political war, which can itself destroy the institutions, as it seems to be in some danger of doing in America. And I suppose the other great danger is of claiming too much. Um, as the world is more and more genuinely interdependent, the, the, the room to put a specific exceptional political swerve or swerve derived from politics on 
what is going on in a particular part of the world becomes more diminished. Um, Mrs. Thatcher's career shows that individuals can and do make differences. You can select the right issue at the right time. You can make. Nobody thinks that the coal mines in Britain would continue for, forever, but we probably saved ourselves 20 years of further decline by doing it roughly and toughly then. Um, but politicians overclaim. I mean, my heart sinks when I hear of some somebody saying that you know they're going to put an end to crime or they're going, you know that the complexity of social causes of things is so great and the interdependence and the globalization of things is adds to the the uh, complexity that a little humility from from politicians and from the papers that the, the I coined a not very um, elegant phrase which didn't catch on surprisingly as well as <laughs> as Eisenhower's political um, political industrial uh, military industrial complex which was I made a speech back in the mid nine early nineties saying that we were really governed by a, a media a politico media complex, which has begun to come a little bit to pieces mm -hmm. with some of the revelations about it, the behavior of the Murdoch press and so on and other press um, but th th that world feeds of of the idea that there are movers and shakers who can do things i mean it's uh, just as uh, an electoral slogan. Um, has to be something like vote for change or say yes like Obama saying perhaps or <laughs> vote for getting some things a bit better is not very easy and for a newspaper to say well these people aren't doing all that badly and it's all very difficult isn't it <laughs> you know, so many newspapers so there's a sort of bubble in which people have to uh, say that I mean Jonathan Dimbleby has to say the politicians are important just as much as the politicians have to say they're important themselves because they, they depend on each other um, whereas actually they're all a bit less important. They do every now and then make a swerve of difference. Mm -hmm. Churchill in the May days really did make a difference mm -hmm. in 1940. It would have gone differently without him. But there are not many occasions of that. Mostly it's quite complicated, boring stuff dealing with events, as Mr. Matlin famously said. Events, dear boy, events. We may come back to that a little, little right at the end, but um, moving on to Eaton. Why did you want to become Provost of Eaton? Well, <laughs> slightly. Um, it was a wonderful timing because the city was clearly not going to be um, uh, an easy place. And uh, um, who knows whether I might not have lost my, lost my job. But in any case, mm. um, lots of people did. Uh, I suppose I'd always had in my mind that a, a respectable place um, as the last job is to be the head of a house in an Oxford or Cambridge college. And indeed, I'd had dangled over me the, a sort of, not a guarantee, but a, a, a sort of interest from an Oxford college. Um, Martin Chartres, who had been provost here uh, uh, two before me, three before me, um, had put in my mind long ago that this would be a, a place to come. When I actually looked at the job compared to an Oxbridge College, it was much more fun because um, I'm the head of, of a charitable foundation with a, with a board and I own the place and run the place so that as long as I'm taking my board with me, I actually have authority. We're not a, 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 an Athenian limited democracy like an Oxbridge College where um, everything is voted upon and the head of house sometimes, not always, can be seen as a rather low-grade person who's been hired to raise the money and um, the serious business is left to others. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they're not always happy jobs nowadays, in, certainly in my experience. So some people have done them brilliantly, like Robin Butler was a wonderfully successful mm. master of Unif when my daughter was there, and others have been very good. My, uh, uh, Carvedy and the president of my college corpus is extremely successful. Now, of course, if by some miracle someone had said we, we want you to be warden of all souls, I would certainly have jumped at that. Were you a fellow of all souls? I'm, I am a fellow you of all souls. You are now. Yeah. Mm. Um, I still am. I have been all through, actually. Um, but I came to the conclusion, and the other factor was that in some colleges there is a very little welcome to the spouse mm. um, and no role unless they happen to have an academic mm. position themselves. Mm. Or, 
and Cyril who lonely uh, uh, Tim Lancaster who was head of my college at Corpus um, used to go back after dinner to London because his wife really found that she didn't, wasn't welcome or so she thought so whereas Caroline whose great great uncle M.R. James was mm. famous provost here um, found a huge welcome here and indeed her predecessor um, uh, um, Poppy um, Anderson had had a major role so that there was a, a, an open arm welcome for a provost's wife who wanted to join in the institution. So for both reasons, the, the, the sense of leading a confident, independent place um, with uh, a fine international reputation and uh, of course all sorts of negatives coming with it, mm -hmm. but confident in its role, with room for manoeuvre, with where the job is to be the executive chairman of the foundation. Obviously, I don't run the academic side, and my job is to appoint a headmaster to do that, but I run the business of the place. Um, and with Caroline's connections also, it seemed very attractive and was very attractive, and I don't regret it for a moment. And for those people who are watching this who knew nothing about Eton, um, is, is there any way you could paint a picture of its distinctive ethos and yeah. character? Well, it's a complicated institution and because it's become so famous, it drew ahead about a hundred years ago, it's not always so, it drew ahead of the pack of, of the other public schools. I don't quite know why, but it did. Um, um, its own school song is modest about its comparisons with Harrow and rugby and, and, uh, and so on. Whereas now, certainly in the press, these are all fine schools, um, it's the one that gets all the attention, the headmaster pointed out not long ago that he was looking at a quick crossword in some newspaper and it said school, four letters, <laughs> and he knew what the answer was. Um, so it's got a place in, in the English, English consciousness and perhaps international consciousness which is odd but unique. Um, it's an institution which is, the analogy, the metaphor I use is, is um, of a snake, it, it keeps its skin but changes its inside, the opposite to a snake. Snake drops its skin, keeps its, its skeleton. Uh, we do the, the opposite here. It, it keeps its traditional forms but it revolution, it's, it's quite a radical institution in, in revolutionizing itself in each generation. Um, it moved itself from being a, a comprehensive school for the upper classes, which it was when I was here. You, you put down your name by, and you got in without any particular uh, academic hurdle if you were first on the list and the people who were first on the list were the people whose parents had been first on the list. In the 80s it made itself, as the grammar schools went down, it began to respond to the demand for a selective education which the state wasn't providing anymore and it's now pretty academic. Um, it's <coughs> far more humane and far more um, inclusive than it was in my day. 20% of the boys here are on bursaries and we're trying to put that up to 25%. Um, it's not particularly, unlike a lot of other English public schools, not particularly uh, uh, dependent on overseas students. It has about 8 to 10%, which is about what it always had, which is lower than most, curious enough. But we have a lot, we're working hard to build bridges with those parts of the state sector that recognize that they may every now and then have a child who needs a structured uh, environment and high academic um, and sporting facilities and we get about uh, we, we get large numbers of six form scholars now coming out of the state sector into our so it's in it's undergoing one of its perennial changes to continue to be a part of the British education system. People come and say, why don't you build schools in the Gulf or China or Malaysia? Mm -hmm. and we could, but what part of British? We're a British educational charity. We should be doing things here, I think. And we are, and we're uh, building a, uh, we're the sponsor of a free school, we're the sponsor with others of a, a selective sixth form academy in East London. We're part of a, of a multi-academy trust in Slough. And I believe in a free society that will always have be independent schools. Um, 
there should be. Uh, for the state to have a monopoly of education is a very dangerous thing in a society. Uh, and the independent schools can, fo can follow various strategies, as has always been, to try and make ourselves a partner with um, whatever the, the society of the day wants. In Victorian times, we produced the, uh, what, we were, what there was demand for, which was the young imperial officers and administrators and politicians. And now I think the purpose is to use our freedom and our resource to experiment with, with um, teaching methods and with um, being always on the frontier of, of understanding of what's going on in educational theory and to then try and help people to spread it. And yes, it'll always be privileged um, because it's expensive for the majority of people who come here, they're not for all. Um, we're a charity that depends on being able to help other people by charging the majority. <coughs> <coughs> so it's fun, and, it, and it's fun being around the, the young, um, and it's fun being part of an institution which has retained its confidence in a way that, much as I love it, my beloved University of Oxford sometimes hasn't. <laughs> um, just two, a couple of final things. Uh, one is, we really haven't talked about your own inner intellectual life, your interest in, for example, books and book collecting or philosophy or, or um, things that, you know, after the formal life is done, music or art or whatever. I wondered what, what was important in your life in that way. Well, my own personal um, ambition has always been the, the, the not ambition is the wrong word. My my objective. I've I've always I've always felt that um, there is no particular reason why um, you can't have some understanding of the, all of human knowledge. Now I know that the last person who could genuinely uh, understand everything that was going on at the frontiers of, was probably I don't know in the early nineteenth century or something. Perhaps John Stuart Mill or goodness knows. Um, um, so that there's no way in which anybody can really understand string theory, or really uh, and and really understand the notation of medieval music, and really understand Plato, and really understand French literature. But I've always thought that it's defeatist not to try and understand the shape of the landscape in, in across the board if you can. Um, and I love, I, I, I'm inquisitive, I suppose, and I've never accepted the idea that if you're interested in how a motor car works, you shouldn't also be interested in Bach or vice versa. So that I suppose my culture is, is easily criticizable, therefore, as being very thin, very thin veneer. I'm not really an expert in anything. And I greatly envy you. Look at the boys here who can play the most astounding music. Or I, you, I look at my twin when I was elected to All Souls, Simon Hornblower, who's a proper classical scholar. And I'm not any of those things. But I do love the sense of feeling in, in the old stoic, Marcus Aurelian way that, that nothing is alien, that, that every, everything is interesting. I'd love to have more time to learn about Buddhism and Eastern cultures. I have an Indian son-in-law, which is a, which I'm delighted about because I'm beginning to sort of get a feel a little bit on the surface. And I know all these things are surface things. So that my culture is one of of, of a sort of attempt, at, doomed attempt at universality. I'm not a real bibliophile like some of the people in the Roxburgh Club, like McKittrick at Corpus or somebody. Um, but I love old books. I'm not really musical, but I, 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 I sort of know where the music is. Mm. Um, um, I, 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 when I was in Whitehall, I would walk at lunch through the National Gallery and just look at one picture. I love the old friends. Something about, there's something close to an, an aesthetic recognition. Is something to, an aesthetic feeling is, in my view, something to do with a sense of recognition of something. Um, so that you need to know where the great pictures are and what, what they are. So, 
it's it's a sort of I suppose 18th century um, uh, enlightenment approach to to culture, um, and and my hero of heroes I suppose is is David Hume, um, the, the the cool enlightenment look at the world is what I respect most of all. And the only other thing, although you've touched on it, is, is your family, um, Caroline and the, yes. the children. Well, something happened in 1980 when my um, first daughter was born. I, I, um, I had always then, up to then, and through marriage, because Caroline joined in, had this sort of sense of single-minded ambition. But as soon as my first child, our first child was born, it all fell to pieces, really, um, and I couldn't maintain that being um, prime minister or foreign secretary was really the only objective in life. So that I, I, um, I, I come from a, a happy and reasonably stable family. I was the youngest of seven, um, the powerful family ethos, and that has continued into with my own family, which is therefore central and perhaps a psychologist would say part of the part of the reason that I began to falter in politics was partly that I began to lose the sense that 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 was the only thing in life that really mattered I became very clear that it wasn't the only thing in life that really mattered I always ask but uh, it's like is there anything before you go over the top are there any questions you'd have liked me <laughs> to have asked you oh gosh well you've asked lots and guided me through a lot of things. Um, I, 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 um, I think one of the one of the one of the effects of coming from a big and happy family in a very stable, privileged but stable background where things seem to go on forever has has been uh, a, a, a um, respect for an affection for for those who try and maintain community. Um, I have a soft spot for Peter Laslett in the face-to-face -face society. I, I have a soft spot for imaginary worlds of community, whether they're uh, Jack Aubrey and Patrick O'Brien's ship stories, whether they're um, the rather um, greater writings of William Golding. In the, the, um, uh, I'm interested in the idea that human beings only achieve their humanness, humanity properly in, in a community of some kind. It easily can be distorted, but well, perhaps all my life I've been looking for, and perhaps that's why I've ended up at Eton again, that it's a, that it's a community. Good. Well, I think that's a very nice way to end. Thank you very <laughs> much indeed. <laughs>